Good morning, class. Today's screencast topic is going to be the breakup of the United States right prior to the Civil War. Uh, so we're going to call this screencast secession, secession from the Union. So before we get into how the balance of power is kind of knocked out of scale, because in the 1840s and the 1850s, a lot of what we've been talking about is how politicians and how Americans are trying to maintain a balance of power. And it really seems like a losing effort, that they're not accomplishing what they want to accomplish. So before we get into how this really disintegrates, it really has a lot to do with political parties. So we're going to start with an explanation of the political parties in America. So let's start with the dynamics of the political parties of the 1850s. So it can get a little bit complicated if you don't really follow it closely. So hopefully this will make it clear for all of you so you understand the political party system, how it disintegrates, and what replaces it. So the political party system of the 1850s is known as the second two-party system. And the second two-party system really began in the 1820s with Andrew Jackson and the creation of the Democratic Party. And then later on in the 1830s, the Whigs also kind of come in. So the two-party system refers to the Democrats on the one hand and the Whigs on the other hand. Those are the two political parties. Now, it's called the second two-party system because the first two-party system we talked about earlier in our class, that was the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans which disintegrated about 1816. So this is the second example of the two-party system in American politics. Now what starts to happen here, again, in the 1850s, 18 starts in the late 1840s, is that this two-party system starts to disintegrate also. And it's really because the Whigs start to fall apart. What happens to the Whig Party is they sound too similar to the Democratic Party on a lot of issues, and a lot of the issues of the day, especially slavery. So Northern Whigs start to leave the party, and they start to try and form other parties to, that address their needs better than the Whig Party addresses it. And by about 18, like the mid-1850s, the Whig Party is kind of the thing of the past. It's gone. It's disintegrated. So this whole two-party system, if you remember back, was the brainchild of Martin Van Buren. And what made this two-party system different from the original two-party system, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, was that these were national parties, meaning Democrats were in the North and Democrats were in the South. Whigs were in the North, Whigs were in the South. They weren't sectional parties. The Federalists were primarily a New England party. The Democratic Republicans were primarily a Southern and a Western party. These, he thought, by kind of putting a gag rule on slavery and not talking about it, that you could create a national party that could stay in power longer. So this is really Martin Van Buren's brainchild, and Andrew Jackson was the first time they tried to put this national party into place. So by this time, by the 1840s and 1850s, it starts to kind of fall apart. And you have some new parties kind of come in. So one of the first new parties is the Free Soil Party. And from their name, you can figure out a lot of what they stand for. They're pretty much for no slavery in the new territories, all the new territories that we've gained. And they have a real abolitionist stance. And they're a little bit too radical to appeal to the masses of people. So they stick around for a few years, but they never catch on as a big party that's here to stay. The next party that kind of jumps onto the scene is the Know Nothing Party. And we've talked about this a little bit in our class in the past when we talked about Irish immigration. Their big issue is immigration, and they are very anti-immigrant. So like a lot of third parties, what you should notice in our class, third parties, they don't usually stick around and become big national parties, but what they do is they introduce an issue that is important and maybe gets adopted by the other bigger political parties. So the Know Nothing, they have an anti-immigrant stance, they're anti-Catholic, and their, their belief is America for Americans only, meaning they call original Americans. And to them, original Americans are not Native Americans, what we're thinking of as American Indians. They're thinking of people that can trace their descendants back to the original settlers of America, the English settlers. And they have this idea of 100% Americanism. So there's a lot of religious overtones here, Protestantism versus Catholicism. And the know-nothings are very anti-Catholic and very anti these new Irish immigrants and, you know, for some, in some cases, the German immigrants that are coming in as well. Now, the problem with the Know Nothings is they try to avoid slavery, but they can't avoid it. And their party ends up infighting over the issue of slavery. So the next big third party that's going to stick is going to be the Republican Party, because they meet, meet slavery head on. They are, again, a free soil 
Party. They believe in free soil in the territories, and that is their major stance. But they're a little bit less radical than the Free Soil Party was, and so they start to appeal more to the northern, uh, the common northerner. And you have to understand, the political dynamics have changed also. The Free Soilers, were, free soilers began in the 1840s, and the Republican Party is going to really come about. Its big first election is 1856. So things have happened by that point. You know, Kansas Nebraska Act has been passed. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the Fugitive Slave Law. A lot of things have more, kind of pushed the North further away from the South. So the Republican Party is going to become a really pretty important party in, the, in between 1856 and 1860 in the North. They're growing in power. So this is really the third two-party system, and it's going to stick. This is the two-party system that we have today of the Democrats, and these are some famous Democratic presidents. You have like Bill Clinton, President Obama. JFK, Andrew Jackson, FDR were Democratic presidents, and Republicans. Um, so some famous Republican presidents like George Bush, Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, Abraham Lincoln. So this two-party system really stuck with us. So this is the, the system, the political party system, when we step into the election of 1860. So for the most part, these elections, I've been letting you guys kind of get your information about the elections from the campaign commercials and the campaign speeches. But the election of 1860 is such an important election that I really we need to talk about it as a class. So what starts to happen here? This is a modern day political cartoon about kind of division within the Democratic Party, but this is nothing compared to division at the time of, you know, in the 1860s. What starts to happen is the Democratic Party starts to split within itself on sectional lines, meaning now you're going to have northern Democrats and southern Democrats, and they can't agree on things. And so in 1860, they're not going to even support the same candidate. So the Democratic Party is going to kind of split in two. Now, on the flip side, the Republican Party is not trying to be a national party, because if you think about their stance, they have no chance of being a national party at this time. You know, they're for free soil. So that means the entire South is going to reject the Republican Party. And so they are a sectional party in the North, but they are unified behind their belief, and they are unified eventually behind a candidate as well. So the, the election of 1860 really kind of breaks down to two separate elections. Not necessarily literally two separate elections. This is one election, the election of 1860, but it's almost like two separate races here, one in the South and one in the North, and there are different candidates kind of contesting for these states. And so this really kind of gives an interesting result to the election. So the northern election, you have the northern Democratic candidate that comes out of this is going to be Stephen Douglas. The Republican candidate who's kind of going against Douglas is going to be Lincoln. So kind of reminiscent of the 1858 Senate race in Illinois, Lincoln versus Douglas here in the north. In the south, you're going to have the southern Democratic candidate is going to be this guy named John Breckinridge. And he's going to be going against a guy named John Bell, who's a new party, the Constitutional Union Party which is really the Upper South breaks away and kind of forms their own political party to, they don't agree with Breckinridge as their choice. So this reads some really distinct results. So if you take a look at this map here, this is the electoral map of the election of 1860. And what you could see here, I want you guys just to take a few seconds and analyze the map on your own. Use the colors. Red is Lincoln, green is Douglas, blue is Breckinridge, and yellow is Bell. You can't really see any more, I mean, you can't predict a more sectionally divided country than this. The entire North, red, Lincoln. The entire Lower South, blue, Breckenridge. That Upper South, they voted for Bell, and Douglas is able to win one state. So you have an extremely divided country, so much so that in the South, Abraham Lincoln does not get one single vote. Not one person votes for him in the South. Because he's not even an option on the ballot. You can't vote for Abraham Lincoln. It's not even a possibility. So think about that. Think about if in our elections today, if you had, say, you know, Obama, you couldn't even vote for him in a state. It's really going to cause some anger on both sides and really shows division within the country. So Abraham Lincoln, he wins about 40% of the popular vote, but he wins the majority of the electoral vote. And so that's how he's able to become the president. In actuality, the person who comes in second in popular voting is Stephen Douglas, even though he doesn't win a lot of states. So this result, 
is really what's going to kind of lead to, and the election of 1860 is the catalyst for secession from the Union. Now, secession from the Union means leaving the United States. So if you look here at the bottom of your screen here, this kind of blue-green color, the states like Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida, those are the states that secede from the Union first. They leave the United States and they form their own country called the Confederate States of America. Now, these states, what do they have in common? They're lower south states. They all rely heavily on slavery. And they secede pretty much after they know the results of the election. Pretty much right after that, they're going to secede from the Union. That little bit, um, kind of like a green, almost like color of grass, that's the upper south. And they do not secede from the Union right away. They don't secede from the Union until uh, the firing upon Fort Sumter. Now that brownish color, those are what's known as the border states. And they do not secede from the Union. So those are states like Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. And they all have slavery. So when you think of the Civil War, a lot of people like to simplify it as slave states versus free states. It's not that simple. It's much more complex than that. Not all of the slave states are going to secede from the Union. And there's lots of reasonings for why. And so we're really going to talk about, analyze that a lot in class. Now, the Confederate States of America that's formed, they're going to model a lot of their ideas off America because these guys are Americans. So they form this new country, their flag. This is the Confederate flag. If you notice some similarities to the American flag, it's got the stars representing each state in their new union. They're going to draft the Constitution. They're going to have a Congress. They're going to have a presidency. Um, their president is going to be a man named Jefferson Davis. He's going to take on the presidency. So uh, they're not too different from the United States as far as institutions, concepts, and mentality. Uh, the big division here um, is kind of the sectional divisions, the sectional divisions that we've been talking about you know, prior to this. Now, Abraham Lincoln. He inherits this entire mess. If you look at this, this map here, the gray state, um, that's going to come to symbolize the Confederacy. During the Civil War, the Confederates are going to wear gray uniforms for the most part. And the northern, the northern soldiers, the Union, are going to wear uh, blue uniforms. So by the time Lincoln comes into office, the entire Lower South has already seceded from the Union. They've already left the country. Um, the Upper South secedes while he's the president, basically within the first month or so when he becomes the president. So all of this happens before he comes into office. Why? This is the lame duck period. Lincoln gets elected in November or, or around November. It takes a while to count the votes at the time. But he's not the president yet. So the president at the time, James Buchanan, pretty much does nothing um, to fix these problems. He doesn't even address the secession. He waits and leaves it for Lincoln as he comes into office here. So the, the lame duck period is really long and Lincoln inherits all of these problems here. So I would consider this the worst lame duck period in the history of America. I mean, FDR kind of came in with a lot of problems. You could say Obama came in with problems, but nothing compares to what Lincoln kind of came into. Half of the country was leaving. So he has to figure out how do I solve this problem right from the start. I talk about trial by far, fire as a president. So I want to leave you guys with Lincoln's famous words that we looked at in the Lincoln-Douglas debate. Let's look at it again. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect that it will cease to be divided. And so what Lincoln doesn't want to happen, but almost realizes is going to happen, is there's going to need to be a war to reunify the country and to kind of bring us back together. And so this is kind of be Lincoln's task as president, is to preserve the Union and to try and get the Confederate States back into the country. And so no other president really had a task so difficult coming into office. All right, uh, have a nice night. Uh, good morning, guys, and I'll, I'll see you guys in class.